Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 11, Courtney Brannigan. Courtney, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Chris. Courtney, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, <laughs> right wow. out of the gate. <laughs> Boom. Um, honestly, uh, it's a family thing. It's a family thing. So my uh, my grandma, my one, my grandma is 90 plus. Uh, she still volunteers. Uh, and I watched, uh, I watched my mom give back a lot as a kid. So we were raised by my mom, single, like single parent. Uh, and I watched my mom give back. So parent council, you, know, she, you know, in junior high, she was always in the hallways, <laughs> fixing up the bulletin boards, um, and, and is, you know, a volunteer herself to this day as well. So that's, and, you know, my aunts, my uncles, um, we have that service. And so I think it's, it's a, it's a family trait. Uh, you could have given back in many different ways, like your mother did volunteer wise. Um, but you've decided to go down the political path. You've decided in 2021, you would put your name forward for city council for ward 11. Why now? What is it about the draw to politics now that you believe is the right time for yourself? It's a, it's a combination of factors, Chris. Uh, so it's not just one thing. Uh, so one, just you know, the age of my kids, you know, I'm able to step away from them a little bit more. They're a little more self-sufficient. They're generally able to make themselves breakfast in the morning, uh, <laughs> fold their own laundry, those kind of tasks. Uh, I'm in a great relationship and I have a really supportive partner that makes this a really, really easy leap for me. And I'm also really inspired by some of the projects that I've worked on, um, some of the direction I see the city taking, but also that there are gaps with outgoing counselors on some initiatives uh, that are important to me. And I want to be able to take over and help lead, you know, guide, steer the city in a forward, in a forward looking direction uh, that's, you know, based in community, um, based in giving back. Uh, and based in building a bigger, brighter future. And so for now, 2021 is the opportunity to, to bring that bold conversation to the table. So just to jump on that before I get into my next set of questions is what are those gaps? What are the gaps that you're hoping that you can be the bridge mm -hmm. from this current council to the next council? Because like you did allude to, there mm -hmm. is going to be a high turnover rate. There are three current incumbent uh, uh, councillors who are running for mayor. So potentially only one of them or none of them may be get reelected. And then you have some retiring. So what are the gaps that you see that you want to be that bridge? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the the two that really come to mind for me uh, is the climate strategy, um, which has been uh, championed by Council Farrell. So making sure that we have someone who's willing to take that portfolio, you know, under their wing, and and it may end up being somebody else. Uh, there may be multiple of us elected who decide that that's that is a priority. And so I, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to work on it with everyone. So the climate strategy is a big one. And the other one is the active transportation network. Um, so, you know, how are we building out our, you know, our pathways, our bike lanes, our, you know, our scooter program and, and our transit as well. That's awesome to hear. One of the areas that any candidate has to do is door knock talk to the residents of your ward. Mm -hmm. uh, on your website, which will be linked in the show notes below, you list six uh, key platform areas. And I'm gonna just read them off here. So for those who haven't looked at it, like I have, healthy communities, innovation mindset, transportation options, economic prosperity, sustainable growth, and co-creation of collaboration and collaboration. We'll be talking a bit about some of those here soon. But when you're talking to the residents of Ward 11, are you hearing their concerns and their priorities line up with the platform that you've put forward? Yeah. So Chris, I'll be honest, we actually haven't door knocked a single day yet. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the reason for that has been COVID. We have taken the cautious approach, um, you know, as mask mandates, as we've moving into phase three. So this week is the first week of door knocking. And my reason for that is I wanted to have two vaccines plus my two weeks. Uh, because if I'm going to go to the doors and talk to hundreds of people, uh, I need to be safe and protected so that I'm not bringing, you know, COVID home to my family. 
uh, who also have things that they'd like to be doing in their lives. Uh, also my volunteers, so making sure my volunteers are protected and protecting the people on the doors, right? That's, that's a lot of you know, connections with people. So that's been our marker. Um, for door but you knocking. must, you must be, you might well might not be door yeah. knock. You must be engaging with the residents totally. because you, you don't just launch a campaign and then not do anything and just hope for the best until, because you never yeah. knew when this was going to happen. So <laughs> are the things that you're hearing, whether it be through online engagement, through Twitter, Facebook, uh, the priorities of what you have on your website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they absolutely are. And a lot of that has come from the network that I've built over the past seven to 10 years, um, you know, both through work experience and volunteer experience. A lot of those priorities come out of that. Um, and in my direct experience building on some of those things. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, yes, when we're out literature dropping, we we bump into people. Um, and one of the number thing, one thing that we hear is, can you work with others? And I can say, you know, without a doubt, that's my history. That's my track record. That's what I've been doing for seven to 10 years um, and doing that innovatively, creatively, uh, and then around those priority areas. So around community building, around, you know, a tech sector and an art sector. Uh, so that is what I'm hearing reflected back. And when I do have those online conversations or those one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, what I hear back is I'm so glad to hear you talking about climate. I'm so glad to hear you talking about our transit service. Uh, so those are those are things I am hearing back. Are you hearing things that you are surprised to be hearing about? Because one of the things that any candidate will agree to is when they launch, they expect to know what the uh, the priorities of their ward is. But when you start talking through engagement, through those random encounters on the street, you may hear things that you are shocked at or surprised that this is a concern for people. Are there things that you're hearing that you went, wow, I didn't think that this was a need and I'm happy that someone's bringing this forward to myself. There's not really been any surprises, okay. um, you know, in part because like attracts like. I will say I am probably the most encouraged by the fact that people are wanting to have conversations, conversations about more transit and about our level of tra transit service and increasing our transit service levels. That probably has been the biggest one for me that I thought um, there would be more hesitation on, but I'm actually hearing from people that, you know, as we emerge post pandemic, people are wanting options. People are rethinking what their priorities are, you know, and in the wake of, you know, a record <laughs> week of heat, um, people are seeing the need to make those conscious decisions on how we can all individually, um, have a healthier climate, more climate resilient city. That word there, climate resilient city, those words there can sometimes be a negative thing, especially here in Alberta. And I will be the first to admit I'm pro environment. I believe that we need to start looking at it more seriously. Why is this a priority for you? What have you seen in the last few years that needs to be addressed at a city level to ensure that we look after our green spaces, that we look after our bike lanes, that we potentially start weaning ourselves off of the, and I don't wanna say fossil fuels dead because I don't believe it is, but weaning ourselves off the resilience of the reliance of the boom and bust system that is the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I could give the really canned answer, the future of my children. Uh, but really, <laughs> what it comes down to is uh, also, I'm probably going to, I mean, with modern science, I'm going to be living on this planet probably for another 50 years, right? So I'm yeah. thinking, what do I want 30 years, 40 years, 50 years out from now? What, you know, I don't want to be sleeping in no, you know, in a, in a heat wave when I'm 90. Uh, this just doesn't seem really awesome. So for me, the climate resiliency part of it is mitigating those negative effects that we have on our quality of life, you know, mitigating our, um, our ability to connect and to be with one another. So, I mean, as we saw with the heat wave, most of us hid in our houses, right? There were some moments, right, where we got to go out and play by the river and be in community, but generally those things drive us actually indoors more than often away and apart from each other. So for me, a climate resilient city means that we get to enjoy our natural spaces and our green spaces and our, and our, you know, our live environment in a, in a really healthy and productive way. 
It means we're not canceling our children's sporting events and soccer games or baseball games because it's too hot to go outside and it's unsafe for us. Uh, so for me, climate resiliency really comes down to how do we interact with our city and what are, what are we going to lose out if we are not resilient, if we are not able to mitigate the changes. And we know globally people are moving to cities, um, you know, at a record rate. And so cities need to take the lead and take initiative on being, um, you know, on being change makers on our global climate system. Um, I, I wasn't planning on talking about this topic for a long period of time, but I'm, I'm so happy that you're willing to engage in it. Um, and this is not a question for me. This is a question that I'm playing devil's advocate with you. Some people will say that will cost too much money. It is not the priority of a city or a municipality to worry about environmental resiliency. That is a provincial or a federal issue. What do you say to those people who, who have that opinion, who come up to you when you talk about environmental resiliency and you say, hey, this is why Calgary needs to address it? Mm. I think it's every, I think climate is everybody's responsibility. I, I, we are all part of a city. We are all also part of a province and we are all also part of a, a country and we're also all part of the same world. So who, if, you know, if we're not getting directive from our city, then we're going to be getting directive from the province or federally. And for, in my mind, it's a collaborative effort. It's not one person's responsibility or one order of government's responsibility. It's all of us working together on the changes and effects we can do. The federal government doesn't dictate our, our, our tree planting program. They can give us grants for that, which would be super awesome, right? But as a city, we have so many opportunities and levers to pull um, that don't come at the federal, that don't come from the federal level or don't come from the provincial level. So we can ignore the fact that we have a responsibility to play too. Uh, so, so that would be that. And, and, and is it going to cost a lot of money? everything costs money. I don't know many things that are free, Chris. What? <laughs> you don't right? say. Well, one day I'll give out free hugs again. But um, I, I mean, there is also the ec economic ramifications of not doing it. So we have to look at the bigger picture, right? There's economic ramifications, you know, to building and to not building climate resilient cities and climate resilient countries. So one of the areas that you talked about there, and it sort of leads into my next set of questions, is economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. um, the first priority for this next council will be the budget. The budget will be passed, and if you are the successful candidate on October 18th, you will be looking at a budget for four years. Mm -hmm. That is how Calgary does their budgets, and I believe hopefully everyone knows that. You will have to uh, identify areas that you will want to bring forward. And also, due to the economic collapse of the oil and oil and gas industry, because of COVID-19, there is going to be challenges ahead for us. How do you envision being a prosperous city when you have to look at two of the most global collapses in our economic uh, industries and in our economic households? Because people are struggling. How do you envision yourself being a prosperous city economically when we are facing two big challenges like this. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's important to note, like, so the, the oil bust and boom has a really unique um, kind of flex on how it affects cities um, and, and, and how city budgets are created. So no matter, so oil companies making more money actually doesn't directly affect the city finances. What it affects is all of the businesses that are supporting our city. So, and their, their viability to stay open. So our restaurants, our art sector, um, our local, our local stores, right? Our neighborhood businesses, that is where that boom and bust comes from and how it really affects our city. And so, yeah, getting people back to work, and I'm using that in air quotes for those that are listening is important. And I think the city helping underemployed or unemployed individuals find homes um, in new sectors and, and, you know, reducing the barriers for people to transition, 
that is has to be part of the strategy. Um, so Calgary Economic Development already does have that. They have a tech upskilling program. So are those programs that we need to expand on? You know, how do we encourage entrepreneurship for, you know, consultants, um, you know, either to the oil and gas industry or to a new industry? How do we get people set up on their business, you know, on a new business potentially? Those to me are the levers that the city can pull. But then also recognizing if those affected businesses or restaurants or neighborhood businesses, the art sector, are seeing a decline um, because of the bust, what are the things that they are needing to stay afloat? Is it marketing? Is it having a new conversation about where they're located? Right. I'm going to throw it in there. What are the what's the property tax payment schedule like? How are we rethinking, you know, what? what that could look like across our city. So I, I believe Calgary is going to be a prosperous city. I think Calgary already is a prosperous city. I think we put a lot of emphasis on this bust system and not recognizing the opportunities that come out of it and the skill sets that people are having uh, and how we can work with those individuals um, and identify those individuals to bring them back into the fold. Uh, so that's where I sit on that. Bringing back into the fold is going to be a challenging uh, prospect because we see uh, businesses closing up shop due to the pandemic because the we're open, we're not, we're open, we're not. And then the businesses who have left the city because, well, high property taxes, high uh, business taxes, so they've left. The city of Calgary is not in a unique position here. Cities across the country are facing this. Yes. How do you envision working with our business community to drive businesses back to our community, but also keep the businesses within the communities because you must be hearing from small business owners. You must be talking to small business owners and they must be telling you that if I don't see recovery in the next year, I might have to close up shop and leave or just close up shop and look at a different perspective. I know you talked about economic uh, Calgary Economic Development, which is a great resources for businesses, but what can Calgary City Council and what can you do as the next councillor for Ward 11 do to help those businesses, but also attract new businesses to mm -hmm. our communities? Yeah. And, and I think, Chris, you make a really good point about attracting businesses like to our communities. And so specifically when I think about, I think about like that neighborhood local business, right? The flower shop, the car mechanic. Uh, and, I, and it's really important to be having those conversations. And so for me as a leader in Ward 11, I think one of the things, you know, I've been working on through the campaign and trying to do is like highlight who those local businesses are, right? Talk about, you know, who's just the neighborhood dog walker, right? Or, you know, and, and I see it happen on community chats all the time, the power of the referral. And so is there a referral system, you know, that we can work on and amplify, you know, as a council, you know, in council, through council communications, or, you know, as the counselor, right, through newsletters and social media. Uh, to me, those are the things that actually really drive impact um, in neighborhoods and in for businesses is, is that referral and the recommendation. So, I know the city came out with the with the whole shops shop local. Um, I think that's a program that could be expanded. I think it's going to take concerted effort to be you know going door to door in neighborhoods to be talking about those things. I also look at you know revisioning communities through the local area plan process and talking about which you know small commercial centers could use support. So perhaps the landlord needs a facelift, they need trees, they need benches, they need bike racks. Um, those to me are those micro investments that we can make into neighborhood businesses to help, you know, community members see it as a, as a place to patronize. While we're talking about business attraction, we also have to talk about resident, resident attraction, residence attraction and keeping and retention as well. I'm not sure about Ward 11, but up here in Ward 10, where I'm currently located, you are seeing for sale signs going up on a regular basis. Yes, they're selling really quickly because we have a hot, hot market right now. But if you talk to the people who are leaving, they are saying they're leaving because of high taxes. They're leaving because they don't see the quality of service 
for the payment of that they're using their taxes. Yet again, this is Ward 10. I do not speak for all of this, uh, the city. How do you envision retaining our current population, but also giving those who feel like the value for their taxes isn't being fairly used? Mm-hmm. Chris, I'd be so curious to know where they're going. Do you have any well, idea? Well, I know that one went back to Ontario. The mm. the neighbor, literally, the, our neighbors right beside us, they went back to, if I'm not mistaken, it was either Manitoba or Saskatchewan, just because the market, their their job was mm-hmm. let, they got they got let go because mm-hmm. of COVID nineteen. They went back to go live with their family. So mm-hmm. I cannot say that's for everyone, but there is a large population who might be leaving the city because mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, for sure. So I just want to acknowledge that taxes exist everywhere. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a thing. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, people are leaving for, and I do know that people are leaving for a variety of reasons. And there is house sales to people moving, you know, within the city, upsizing, downsizing. Um, the market's been, you know, especially around detached housing has, has been hot. Um, I will also say, I believe on the heels of COVID, people are really understanding some of those values and priorities. So sometimes it's proximity to family. Um, you know, it, it, it is, what is that work-life balance? You know, what is the city affording them? There was a thread on Twitter the other day about a prominent realtor in Vancouver who's looking to actually move to Calgary for quality of life. So <laughs> we, you know, and I think that's been a real highlight of COVID is what are those things that are really important to us? And so I think that has been a big part of why people are moving. And also like we've all spent like an exorbitant amount of time in our houses and we know probably what's working really well in our houses and like what we would like love to change. <laughs> and, and I think Truth. that's driven. <laughs> and I think that's driven a lot of moves. So like my, you know, my parents, they're they're looking to downsize. They've decided they want to spend more time out in the mountains and less time doing yard work. So <laughs> I'm not sure that the high taxes is truth, but I, I hear what you're saying and I cho- and I believe the like the service level quality um, is a concern for people. And I'm gonna say that our outward growth truly strains our, de- our ability to deliver quality services. So as an example, um, I'll just come now. Calgary and Vancouver aren't total apples to apples just because of like their income and their, the way that they can derive income um, for city for city finances. But Vancouver pays on average about two twenty five per person. So this is like just Vancouver City, not the GTA or GBA. Um, two twenty five per person, whereas Calgary pays closer to about eight dollars per person. Vancouver is also four and a half times more dense than Calgary. So if we were as dense as Vancouver, we would pay less than $2 per person. Yeah. Now, we don't necessarily need to aspire to be Vancouver. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I am suggesting though, is that the bigger we grow, the less value we get for our services. The greater, um, you know, the greater strain it it puts on our ability to deliver. So when I think about taxes, what I want to be talking to people about is how are our services compared to those like cities? So let's benchmark ourselves against Edmonton, you know, on a dollar per dollar basis, are our services better or comparable for a lower tax rate? And if we're sucking, if we're not doing a very good job in a few areas, we need to have conversations like, is that a priority thing? Or is it because, you know, we prioritized low taxes at the expense of quality services. So to me, those are the conversations we need to dig into. And when someone says the taxes are too high, my question always is, who is our benchmark and why? Right? And how are we going to get there? Because we see time and time again, when we lower taxes, we lose services. Now, I'm not here to say we need to raise taxes by any means, but we need to rethink how we're building our city so that we can maximize our tax dollars. So that means looking at empty sites, right? So this this is where that tax uplift needs to come in. And again, I'll go back to the local area plan process. We have underused sites across our city, residential and commercial, 
Um, and how do we spur investment into those areas? And I think that, again, that's a lever the city can pull. Is the city holding onto land that they need to sell that a developer could, you know, support something better so that we have, you know, the best and most purposeful use? Yeah. Now, you are one of the few candidates that I've spoken to, and since I've done the research on you and on your website, uh, that has an actual mention of the local area plans on your website. You believe that we need to continue on with establishing these. Why is this a priority for you? And are you, be, are you hearing that it is needed from the people of Ward 11, or is this something that you believe in yourself that needs to be addressed going forward to ensure that the sustainability of our, our communities is there and will always be there. Mm -hmm. It's uh, so it's a bit of both. So I, when I was with the Haysboro Community Association, I joined the planning committee. Part of our work with the planning committee was working with a couple different groups um, to do some community planning. And that really highlighted for me that people want to have that conversation. People want to be given the opportunity to talk about the future of their neighborhood, of their community. Now the guidebook really opened up the can of worms that suddenly everybody was like, wait, I get to think about something that I've never had to think about before. I mean, when you think about buying a house, you're not thinking about like, oh, I wish this street looked like this and this playground looked like, I mean, you're gonna have little inklings of it, but you. You don't realize, I think, until you start to get into the thick of it, that like you actually get an input and say in the way that your community changes and evolves. Now, there's two ways. You can either say, hey, I'm going to lead that and I'm going to be the initiator and I'm going to take on a community-led project like a playground rebuild or advocating for a safer street. Um, or you can be reactionary and be like, oh my goodness, my neighbor's doing a development. Um, what am I going to happen? Or, oh shoot, the city's What's happening to that green space in the city? Um, now, we are all busy. <laughs> I recognize we are all busy. We all have a lot of information coming to us. Um, so I support the city coming to groups of neighborhoods through the local area plan process and working through that revisioning of neighborhoods, again, for that sustainability. And it's not necessarily just about housing. I think that's the really important part that we got away from in the guidebook. The guidebook, we focused so much on housing type and there was so much more. There is so much more in that document. It talks about, you know, the interfacing of commercial spaces into neighborhoods. It talks about, um, industrial uses and industrial areas in our city and like re and potentially rethinking some of those and even how did those streets look uh, it talks about parks and green spaces and what what's their importance in our neighborhoods as well because when you get to the heart of what people value in their neighborhoods it is people and it is parks and green spaces I have yet to have someone say you know what I love the most about my neighborhood the uniformity of the houses built in 1985 that is not what I hear. <laughs> and, and, but people love the neighbors who live in that house. Um, so, but again, the built form is often what we see. So it is the easiest thing to focus on. Um, and it's the easiest thing to get concerned about. So I, I believe through the local area plan process, we need to do a better job of talking about how does what we create in our neighborhoods create that sense of community, create that, that interaction and the friendliness and the safety and the vibrancy, all of those things that we desire. And that good placemaking, good urban planning gives us those things. East Village is a great example of that. One of the things that uh, as the next city councilor for Ward 11, you will be tasked with is representing your ward, but also representing the needs and the future of the city. Mm -hmm. Most people might not know that while you were there to represent the, the ward, you were also there to represent the vision of the city. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and I will say this because I've covered politics, municipally, provincial and federally, your ward might go without because something else is needed in another ward. How do you envision standing up for your community, standing up for your ward while looking out for the future of the city? Yeah, that's a, uh, Chris, that's a great question. And it's something I've been talking with people about is a lot of the decisions that council make actually probably more affect the 
the greater city than individual, you know, neighborhoods, communities, or wards. Um, and often, you know, one decision is just sort of the catalyst for decisions in other areas, right? So even like the local area plan process, North Hill is just the catalyst for a bunch of others yeah. that are going to be trickling out from that. So one, I think it's a really good, um, having a really good understanding of your of all of your community's needs is really important because then as projects come up across the city, paying attention to those so you can figure out how can you benefit you know, how can you learn and benefit to bring those similar projects, you know, back into your own neighborhood? So that's really about understanding and learning. So, I mean, I think of something like playground rebuilds. Playground rebuilds happen across communities all of the time, but every individual group is so siloed. Who's the conduit between those people, even if it's the North and the South? I mean, a playground build is a playground build for the most part. They're pretty cut and dry. Well, that's not true. I shouldn't say that. They all have their own hiccups, but a lot of those hurdles are the same. And how are we fostering learning between those different groups? Um, so for me, that's that's what I see at that kind of high level city building process also like, and that the same then would go for like development, right? How are different developments getting approved? What are some of the challenges around that? So, you know, whether it's, you know, putting in row housing versus a, a, a detached house learning and looking and seeing what's happening on the citywide picture is important. And I'm going to say, I'll highlight because you said you're in Ward 10, there is an east-west divide in our city, undoubtedly. And, and I would say there's a north-south divide as I well. I would say that there's a north-south divide as well. And I think as a counselor, yeah, even though my focus should be Ward 11, I, I believe that we need to be creatively looking at how some of our underserved communities are going to reap the benefits of citywide prosperity. Um, I was part of some of the established areas working groups and you know some of the work they're looking at is you know how do we get money from development back into neighborhoods? Well that is if we go with a model that is only neighborhood specific and this was you know things we talked about if we went with a model that's only neighborhood specific neighborhoods that see no redevelopment are not going to get those community amenity bonus things. And that to me is a challenge because it's the haves are getting more and more and more and the have nots are getting less and less and less. And so those are to me the, like the equity models in our financing structures that we need to look at. On that note, just to, to piggyback onto that, people of your ward will come up to you and ask for the sky. Let's be honest. They will ask for the anything under the sun because they believe their community needs it. They, they might need mm -hmm. a new park. They might need new bike trail. They might need mm -hmm. new parking spot. Sometimes a counselor will have to say, we can't do that, whether it be financially, whether it be uh, just purposely, it like doesn't make feasible sense to do it. How do you envision yourself working with people who might disagree with you, but also who might have ideas that are just not realistic in today's society? So I'll give you a great example of this, Chris. Love it. Love it. Love it. Great examples. We have an, um, at, so there was a portion of sound wall that was added to an existing sound wall. Now the existing sound wall was probably built in the eighties and the new sound wall was built, you know, in 2020 or whenever, but they were built years apart. doesn't matter the date. Yes. They don't look the same. I heard a community member say, well, they should have just replaced the whole thing. So it was uniform. The same person will tell me that taxes shouldn't go up. So I think we're, we just, and I think it's about, to me, there has to be a bluntness and an openness and an honesty with people saying, listen, you got it some part of a new sound wall. I agree, it doesn't match. Can we paint it so it looks a little more uniform? Like, where's the compromise? But then replacing millions of dollars more, but then don't talk about how the city overspends. <laughs> so I, I, and, I, and I think sometimes we need to point out the glaringly obvious. Now, I also think the city needs to do a better job of when they're working on projects that when they're working in an area to stop, take a step back, 
take a broader scope, right? Paint that circle a little bigger to say what can happen in and of the same time. So I will actually use the Southwest BRT as, a, as an example. So the Southwest BRT has gone in. There's still things that need to be done. I don't know why. Councillor Farrakh is here to worry in. Uh, sorry. If he wants uh, to come on the show, he can totally answer that question. Yeah. Uh, anyway. But there was some sound wall that was near it. Now, it wouldn't have been in scope for the project, but there was sound wall being done that was in scope for the project at the same time as the BRT was going in. Had some of that whole sound wall been identified when you have a crew on site, both for demolition and construction, those are opportunities for cost savings. So those are projects we need to look at. Unfortunately, when we do a four-year budgeting cycle, when we lock ourselves into this four-year budgeting cycle without flexibility, except for perhaps the fiscal stability reserve, um, we are always dipping into that. So in my mind, we need to be thinking in our four-year budget cycle, um, you know, how does our capital realize into our operational? And do we have flexibility in our operational? So if a capital project gets approved, there's flexibility to do that bigger picture thinking. So, I, and, but this is a whole other big conversation around, um, you know, what sits, what sits in the operations budget and what sits in the capital budget as well. And we could probably spend another full hour on that if we had it. <laughs> um, one of the next two big infrastructure projects that you will have to address in the next city council is the green line and the arena deal. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been talking to people and if this has come up on a regular basis, but the people I speak to, and this is not just here in Ward 10, but across the city, they're frustrated. They're frustrated that this mm -hmm. these projects have taken so long to get going. Shovels are still not at the ground. They, they say they're going to be in the ground soon for the south end of the Green Line, but let's be honest, we are still waiting. Mm -hmm. How do you envision yourself working with a diverse group of um, councillors? Because like we said at the beginning of the interview, there will be a new swap of uh, councillors to ensure these projects is go ahead, but they don't go over budget because fiscal restraint, economic prosperity, or uh, well, economic prosperity is one key point, but projects do go over. Projects overrun all the time. I think mm -hmm. anyone will admit if you're redoing your house, you know you have to have a contingency plan for a potential overrun. How do you envision yourself working with the contractors, but also working with your city councillors to ensure that these projects finally go ahead and potentially bring jobs to this community, these, uh, <laughs> the city? A okay, lot of well, questions let's... there, and I hope you <laughs> follow some of them. <laughs> All right, let's address. Okay, so we have the arena and we have the green light. So let's mm -hmm. address them individually. Yes, okay. start with the green line. Start with the green line. Okay, so uh, high level pro green line. Uh, I always pro investing into trans transit infrastructure. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. <sighs> It's really hard at this point, Chris, to say, I'm gonna do A, B, and C, and F, Y, and X, and one, two, and seven, um, partly because without looking at that high level budget detail, without having all those numbers in front of me, I can't look and say, this is where I would save money. What I would say is that I have priority areas for those infrastructure projects. And for me, that is interfacing into community. Um, and how people get to and from our transit stations to optimize it. I think the Green Line's got opportunities along some business routes to have better conversations around some business partnerships to perhaps realize some of that interfacing. Um, how do we build out some of that so that there is a benefit going in both directions? Uh, so Quarry Park is a really good example of that. How do we talk with Remington? you know, who owns the majority of that site around some of that neighborhood interfacing, some of those interconnections and linkages so that people can get to businesses and get to their houses um, and get to those amenities that are close to the train station. Uh, you know, similarly, as it, you know, as it moves kind of in toward downtown, there's a station near Crossroads Market and there's a whole bunch of businesses down there and breweries down there. Are we giving them the opportunity to be part of the project? 
those to me are the conversations, right? Can we create a BIA around that? Is that an opportunity, right? So for me, those are the innovative solutions we need to be looking at around infrastructure projects uh, and, and that neighborhood interfacing. Okay, so that's, that's Green Line. The Harvey. arena, because you are openly in favor of more arts and more uh, culture yeah. because it's on your website. So this would be a, a slam dunk for you because this is bringing arts and culture to the downtown core. But I, as, as I say that, you grimace a little bit. So I'm assuming you have some comments on it. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, hmm. Okay, so arts and culture, yes, why not? And now, is it bringing arts and culture at the local level, investing back into local community, local artists? Mm, I don't know. I've yet to see that. Now, if we can realize the public component of this, which has been promised, um, the public plaza, the public interfacing, um, and the opportunities, um, you know, then for local arts and businesses, um, and culture to be a part of that structure or that area, then yes. So again, this comes back to that, that public component of it. And so when I think about the Saddle Dome right now, it is virtually behind lock and key or behind a paywall, both the building and the land that it sits on. So when was the last time you felt comfortable just strolling through Calgary Stampede land? Land when no event was going on or you weren't intentionally there for an event if we can't, build can't a say ever <laughs> can't say ever can't say ever even on the east side where the river is where the stampede owns some land and the pathway goes through and you can go across the bridge it feels a little awkward at times you kind of feel like you're passing through somebody else's land so I'm really cautious with the arena deal that we don't create that same environment so that people actually want to go frequent that area. So like an Olympic Plaza or like an East Village River Walk, do people feel like they own the space, like that it is public in that sense? Uh, so for me, that is probably the most important part of the arena deal that I want to see um, actualized. And that is, that is where my focus and priority will be. Now, obviously, yes, there are budget overruns um, already kind of announced. I don't know what the details of those are. Is it the cost of construction materials? Is it something else? I don't, you know, is it design changes? Again, I'm not privy to those conversations right now. I don't care for the leaked details um, and the hinting and the suggestions of why. Uh, I, so I, I, am watching to see kind of what details emerge and I don't know when you're releasing this Chris but I'm watching to see and until I really get to see that deal for myself if I get to see that deal for myself I think it's really hard to pass judgment on the yeses or the noes right I have reservations absolutely um you know with the with the crossover runs being announced so soon that said, I would rather them be announced up front than start into the project and suddenly they crop up. So I would rather have them dealt with at this stage than halfway through or a quarter of the way through. True. Um, looking at October 19th, day after the election, Courtney Brannigan is counselor elect for the great Ward, Ward 11. Mm -hmm. What is priority number one for you? Oh, bringing cupcakes. <laughs> Just where are you bringing them to? Because you're, you're probably going to be sleeping a lot. <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll give you the backstory to that. So uh, I often will have counsel on in the background and there was some bickering happening one day. And, and my one daughter, she's like, someone just needs to bring them all cupcakes because then they'd all get along. Um, and I was just like, that is so brilliant. Cause it's true. Food brings people together. Uh, so priority one is bringing cupcakes. And <laughs> so that's priority one. Yeah. So after I have best a good answer sleep in, to that ever, best answer. So yes. <laughs> so yes, Chris, after I probably sleep in, um, uh, bringing cupcakes. And I think it's really about like reaching out to, so one, you know, reaching out to people I ran against to say thank you for bringing forward conversations and topics 
you know, that I might not have had on my radar, but that have cropped up over the course of the campaign, right? So like a thank you to that. Um, it's going to be a bitter, I'm going to be honest, it's going to be a bittersweet day. I have met so many great candidates across the city and like some from the same ward and it's, it's going to be a bittersweet day. I think I'm going to be so happy to be working with some people and I'm going to be so sad to not be working with other people. That's, that's how I'm honestly looking at October 19th. So it's going to be a lot of reaching out to people and having conversations saying, you know, thank you for amplifying, you know, what Calgary could be during the past six months. Thank you for bringing forward conversations that are important to your ward, um, you know, that I need to pay attention to as well as I move forward. And it's, and then it's going to be about celebrating the team, right? Celebrating the people and the backers and the supporters that I've had, um, you know, throughout the campaign who have, you know, been by my side, who've, you know, held my hand, who've taken a phone call, who've, you know, walked with me as I've ranted. Uh, it's going to be a lot of that. So that is priority one. Priority one is people and relationships. Now I really need to put your put your time time hat on. Twenty twenty five October twenty October twenty twenty five. Four years after you're first elected, what is a successful first term for Courtney? Mm. Well, hopefully not too much weight gain from the cupcakes, but <laughs> or too many more gray hairs. <laughs> what is successful? Um, successful to me is being asked to run again being um, and, and wanting to run again. Um, successful to me is being able to say, these are the investments that I brought, that I helped usher into, you know, not only my communities, but into the city. Um, successful to me um, is having stood up for what I believed in, right? For, and for, and for being able to, vocalize why would it have made or not made a certain decision um so a lot of it is just you know making sure that the end of four years that I have felt like I've been authentically Courtney um you know true to you know my values um but also the directions um that we're being given by citizens as well to do that you have to be elected on October 18th why should you be the next city councillor for Ward 11? Oh, so Chris, one of the things I've been saying is I want to campaign like I want to lead. Um, and so for me, that is uh, about kind of, it's about three, three key things. So one is collaboration, working with others. Um, and I've been doing that throughout the campaign. Um, I have I have some like little things in the works that are that will hopefully be coming up <laughs> um, that you'll hopefully see um, to to give back to other candidates as well. So like really stepping away from oh you're this person and that's what you represent. So I don't I don't want to have anything to do with you. So the collaboration piece. So having lots of conversations and conversation is the other one. I'm willing to have the conversation as hard it is as it is. Um, but in that conversation, there's two parts. There's the listening, and then there's the asking questions back. Uh, and I'm a question asker. <laughs> that is, I'm inherently curious, and I want to, um, I want to get in, and I want to ask those hard questions so that we can get to solving some of the complex problems we have. Um, and the other one is celebration. We have one of the highest used library systems across North America. We have amazing parks and recreation. And I truly believe we need to celebrate what we have, have that as our foundation. And then how do we, again, have that conversation about building from that? How do we build what we want from the things that we really enjoy? Because to me, that is what shows what our values are, what shows what our priorities are. And so, you know, leading from that. Um, and again, as I said, you know, sharing resources. So I, I mean, on my Instagram, I like if a community association or another organization put something up and they need a call out, I'm sharing it. 
right? I'm encouraging people to go explore the city. I've got, I've, I did a winter city challenge. We've got a summer city challenge. Um, you know, I, I'm creating something that's as happy as community. And the reason there's no Ward 11 or Courtney is because that's a mindset that will outlast this campaign. And the people who are going to be attracted to that, like those are going to be community builders all the time. And for me, that's why I want to inspire other people. I want to inspire other people to have those conversations, right? To celebrate um, and to collaborate and to build great things for Calgary. And I feel really ready and energized and excited um, at the thought of working with other people. To do that, you have to win a campaign. I do. How can, how can people get involved in your campaign? How can people learn more about you? How can people donate to you? Oh yeah. Well, I have this, I have this new fandangled technology called a website. Have you heard of those? What? What? <laughs> I have. I have, I know it's amazing. There's like, they can do so much these days, Chris. So, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. It's a Tuesday. All right. So my website's Courtney. Now you realize I have to put this out on a Tuesday, right? <laughs> because yeah. you just said now it's a Tuesday. Sorry. Now I have to put it out on a Tuesday, but I'm continue sorry. on. I'm sorry for how that can pressure. People, how can people get involved? All right. So here's what we're doing. So our summer plans, we're going to be door knocking. Uh, we're also going to be doing some park pop-ups. So if like the idea of going to someone intimidates you but like the idea of having kind of someone come to you on their own time and on their own schedule we're going to be doing a whole bunch of park pop-ups um across ward 11 and connecting with people kind of i i have this thought that we need to meet people where they're at um so to me meeting people where they're at means just being where they are um because they're ch they're choosing that right so i i believe in giving people that choice so we're gonna do park pop-ups they're gonna be super fun uh, I just got um, a spinny wheel to win prizes. If you come talk to me, so I'm trying to incent people to win things. <laughs> I will be there to win something. <laughs> I, I can't wait to give you a button for your bulletin board, Chris. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, we, I mean, there's always going to be a job. Um, donations are always welcome. So I'm sure someone else has talked about this. Donations are by individuals this year. Um, that's part of the new municipal campaign finance rules. There is no corporate donations. So everything that is coming in is from people who believe in the vision, who believe in the mission um, of getting Courtney elected. So if that, if this has all resonated with you, those dollars pay for all the things that we need to do to reach, you know, the 65,000 eligible voters across Ward 11. For those listening and to those viewers, um, the links to Courtney's website, Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter will be in the show notes below. I highly recommend that you go out and check her out. Follow her if you're in Ward 11. Learn a little bit more about the candidates. Uh, this election is important. It's uh, the deciding the future of Calgary. And I highly recommend that you get involved, you vote, and you learn a little bit more about the candidates. Courtney, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a pleasure. Don't forget, I've got a TikTok too. I'm, oh, okay. I, I, I'm not... I'm not all up on the TikTok, so I don't know the TikTok. So to the candidates, I say, no, I'm not promoting your TikTok. That's fair. That's totally fair. But just in case someone, you know, young and hip, not that I'm young and hip, but in case that well, the young kids don't say hip either. Also, yeah, right. Courtney, thank you so much. I'm going to try and get this interview out so that way we don't make a fool of myself here. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Chris. I so appreciate the opportunity today.